Hey everybody, welcome back to Chemistry. And today, what I wanna talk about is writing something called a Lewis structure. And so what a Lewis structure is, is a simple drawing or representation of a molecule. And in that drawing, you'll see lines and dots. Lines will be between the atoms in the molecule and represent a shared pair of electrons, while dots will be sort of on the outsides of the atoms and they represent lone pairs. So Lewis structures are pretty important to learn because if you go on to organic chemistry, you're gonna to have to draw a lot of Lewis structures. And so it's pretty important now, I would say, to learn how to do this correctly. So there are certain things I can tell you to do that I hope will be able to help you in that goal. Um, so I have some steps here on how to write a Lewis structure. And so let me just kind of quickly go over them only because I'm going to be doing a bunch of examples on the glass board. So one of the first things you'll have to do is you're going to be given a formula, say like N2 or CHCl3, something like that. And from the formula, what you'll have to first do is draw a skeletal structure of the molecule, meaning you're gonna to have to use elemental symbols and place them in space in reasonable positions. This, after you've done that, the second step is to count the total number of valence electrons that are contributed by all atoms in this structure. The next step is once you figure out the total number of valence electrons, you think about them in terms of pairs. The first pairs you deal with you stick in between atoms. And usually it's between some kind of central atom and a peripheral atom. After that, you'll have some valence electrons that are left. And there you put those as dots, as lone pairs around first the peripheral atoms. And once they have a octet or something near an octet of electrons, then you can put electrons around the central atom. Then the goal after you've done that is to make sure that all atoms except hydrogen have an octet, meaning they have eight electrons that surround them. With hydrogen, it's not eight electrons or an octet. It's only two electrons, which is called a duet. And so to finally finish the structure, if you're in a situation where you've drawn the structure, but you don't really have octets around the atoms, it may be necessary to move electrons from the lone pairs into the bonds to make sure that all atoms have an octet. Okay, so what I'm gonna do is, for several molecules, is I'm gonna draw out a Lewis structure. And I'll show you how to do that in, in detail. And then what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna look at the electronegativity difference between the atoms in the bond because that determines the bond polarity. And that is important to be able to figure out. And then finally, what I wanna do is once we figured out the bond polarity, I wanna figure out if there is sidedness to the molecule. In other words, is there a side which has a relative excess of charge? And so you would represent that with a delta negative sign. And is there another side of the molecule with a relative deficiency of charge, which we would represent as a delta positive. So let's go ahead and begin. So the first one I wanna do is maybe one of the simplest Lewis structures to draw, which is that for water. So you'll be given a formula for water, for example, and you know what that is, it's H2O. So the first thing you need to do is you need to write out a skeletal structure indicating where you think the nuclei of these three atoms are gonna be in space. So let me show you a couple of possibilities here. So we have two hydrogens and an oxygen. So maybe one hydrogen nuclei might be here, another one might be here, and another one might be there. That may be a possibility. Or maybe another possibility is have hydrogen here and then oxygen in the middle and then hydrogen on the end. So is there an answer that is correct between these two skeletal structures? And the answer is yes, this one's correct and this one's not right. And so one of the rules you'll have to remember about drawing Lewis structures is that hydrogens are always at the ends of the molecule. They are at the sort of the termini of the molecule. So here with this skeletal structure, we don't have a hydrogen in the end, it's in the middle, and you can't have that. So you cannot use this representation here. Um, 
this one is a good one to start with. Okay, so now what I want to do is count the total number of valence electrons for all atoms involved in the structure. So we have one oxygen and two hydrogens. So oxygen has six valence electrons, and then hydrogen, as you probably know, has one valence electron, but there are two of them. So the from the hydrogen atoms, you have a total of two valence electrons in the structure. So all total, we have six valence electrons from oxygen, two electrons from the two hydrogens, so we have eight valence electrons. And so we want to think about this in terms of pairs. So if we have eight valence electrons, you can think of it as four pairs of valence electrons. So I'm going to write four pairs here. Okay, so what is the next step? The next step is we're going to distribute four pairs of electrons around this skeletal structure in a way that sort of makes chemical sense. And so there are steps to that. So the first step is to first connect oxygens with hydrogens. You want to bond these atoms together. And so you might know at this point that within a bond, whether it's an ionic bond or a covalent bond, here we're going to be dealing with molecules mostly that are covalent bonds, you have a pair of electrons usually that form a bond. Now you can have more than that, but to start with, we're just going to connect atoms with a pair of electrons. So we have four pairs here, so I'm going to connect oxygen and hydrogen with this pair of electrons here, and then oxygen and hydrogen with this pair of electrons here. So now we're down to two pairs. We have two more pairs to put on the structure. So one question you can ask is, are you allowed to put another pair, say, around this hydrogen here? And the answer is no. And the reason is we're going to count how many electrons these atoms have in a minute. But when we do the count, what you'll see is that hydrogen really only has two electrons associated with it, and that's all it can have. It cannot have more than that. It cannot have eight or an octet. It cannot have any more than that. So if hydrogen cannot accept any more electrons, then the other two pairs will go around oxygen. Oxygen can accept two pairs here. And so here it can accept up to eight electrons. And so it looks like oxygen has a total of eight electrons. Okay. So the next thing we're going to do is to confirm that we've written a good Lewis structure, we have to make sure that the hydrogens here only have a duet, a pair of electrons, while other atoms have an octet or eight electrons. So let's do some electron counting. So let's first count the electrons associated with hydrogen. So you see we have a pair shared here between this left hydrogen and this oxygen. So this pair here that is shared, that is considered also in the hydrogen count. So hydrogen has two electrons, and so that's good. That's what we want. And so this hydrogen on the right also has two electrons because this pair is shared between the oxygen and the hydrogen, and it's considered in the hydrogen count. So this hydrogen here as well has two electrons. Now let's count the electrons associated with oxygen. So this pair up here is with oxygen, this pair is up here. How about the pair between oxygen and hydrogen? Those are also considered in oxygen's electron count. Again, again, they're shared between the oxygen and the hydrogen here. So when you count the electrons for oxygen, you want the lone pairs out here, but also you want to count the ones that are shared with the hydrogens. So what we can see is that these hydrogens have a duet which makes the hydrogen atom stable. And then this oxygen has an octet, which makes the atom stable. So we have used up all eight electrons. Um, so this is, uh, it looks like the atoms in the structure will be stable. So to make a final Lewis structure, the last thing you do is you want to draw lines for shared pairs. And so we have a, a shared pair between this oxygen and this hydrogen here. So we draw a line for that. You do not draw lines for lone pairs. Lone pairs on this oxygen atom here are just kept as dots. So the final Lewis structure is this. So I've drawn lines there um, for the shared pairs, and we have dots for the lone pairs. Now, a question that is often asked is, do you have to put the hydrogen on the opposite side? 
of the other hydrogen from the oxygen. And that's not necessary to do. So an equivalent Lewis structure, which is equally good, is if you happen to put um, the hydrogen at an angle here like 90 degrees. And so that will work just fine too. So either of these structures is a good Lewis structure for water. Now, the next thing I want to talk a little bit about is evaluating the polarity of the bond between oxygen and hydrogen. So let me sort of remind you how you do that. So you have to hopefully have a table of electronegativities and look up the electronegativities of the atoms. So I kind of know that oxygen has an electronegativity of 3.5 and hydrogen has an electronegativity of 2.1. So you can see that they have different electronegativities. And so if you wanted to, you can calculate the difference of electronegativity um, between these atoms. So the difference of electronegativity is just you take the higher electronegativity and subtract the lower electronegativity. Um, and then the difference of electronegativity is 1.4. So you look at that number, and from that number, you can sort of evaluate the kind of bond here that occurs between oxygen and hydrogen. You might remember from an earlier presentation, if the difference of electronegativity is between 0 and 0 0.4, that is considered a relatively nonpolar covalent bond. If it's between 0 0.4, or say 0 0.5 and 2, this bond here is considered a polar covalent bond. And if you are above two, then you're really into the ionic bond range. So right here, you can see that this kind of characterizes this bond as polar covalent. So here, this bond here is polar covalent. Now we have an identical bond to a second hydrogen atom here. So this bond as well is polar covalent. So, Let's talk about what that means in terms of the charge distribution, the electron distribution of the shared pair between the different atoms. So let me draw this again. So we have water here. I'm just going to draw it like this this time. So oxygen has the greater electronegativity. So what that means is that when you consider a shared pair of electrons here between oxygen and hydrogen, remind yourself that these shared pair is kind of wandering around both oxygen and hydrogen. Slight digression, you might remember that oxygen also has these lone pairs. These lone pairs are localized in these positions around oxygen, so they tend not to be shared with the hydrogen. But looking at the shared pair here between this oxygen and hydrogen, it will wander around between the oxygen nuclei and the hydrogen nuclei. But the electronegativity of oxygen is much greater than the electronegativity for hydrogen. Remember what electronegativity is, it's a ranking of a atom's nuclei attraction for a shared pair of electrons. So if oxygen has electronegativity of 3.5 and hydrogen has electronegativity of 2.1, in that tug of war for the shared pair, oxygen will definitely win. So the electrons here will spend a lot more time around oxygen and not as much time around hydrogen. Same thing here in this bond, the shared pair here will spend a lot of time around oxygen, not as much time around hydrogen. And so because the electrons in the shared pair are spending a disproportionate amount of time around the oxygen, um, there are electrons. So we indicate that we get sort of more electron density around the oxygen by putting a delta negative here near the oxygen. And the hydrogen here will be a delta positive. Okay, so that is the Lewis structure of water and that sort of explains the electron distribution of the shared pairs. Um, in the structure. So let's move on to another one, a little bit more difficult. Okay, so the next molecule we're going to do is gaseous diatomic oxygen. So this is a little more difficult, but not too bad. Let me get a good pen here. I guess this will work. <laughs> All right. So we have oxygen here. So can you draw a Lewis structure for oxygen? Again, a little trickier. So the first step is to draw out the skeletal structure which shows where the nuclei of these atoms are in space. So I'll have one oxygen there and one oxygen there. So that was easy enough. Okay, the next step is to figure out how many total valence electrons are we dealing with in this molecule. So we have oxygen and each oxygen atom has six valence electrons and there are two of them. And so you have a total of 12 valence electrons. And so you have a total of 12 valence electrons. You have six pairs you have to deal with. Okay, so, so far, so good. So 
Do you remember how we deal with the pairs of electrons? The first thing we do is we bond atoms together with a pair. So here I'm putting a pair here. So now we're down to five pairs that we have to deal with. Okay, so where do they go? Okay, so you can distribute them around the two oxygen atoms. So here's pair two, here's pair three, um, here's pair four, here's pair five, and then I'll put, just arbitrarily put pair six here on this oxygen atom. So that is fine. We've done everything perfectly fine at this point. So now what we do is we check to make sure that our atoms there have eight electrons. They have octets. Um, so let's look at the left oxygen. And so you can see it has three pairs here in this shared pair. So this oxygen has four pairs of electrons, so it has an octet. But how about this oxygen here? So it has these two pairs here, but also you count the shared pair here. And so here, the oxygen atom on the right here does not have an octet. It only has six electrons. And so we have a problem here. So let me redraw the structure and then talk about how we solve the problem here. So one, the problem is this, one of the oxygen atoms has an octet and the other one doesn't. So how do we sort of fix this so that both atoms have octets? Well, what you can do is if you're in this situation, you can move lone pairs in between or into between atoms and then that can help solve the problem. So let's just try that. So let's just take uh, this lone pair here on this left oxygen here on the bottom here and move it between the oxygen atoms like that. And just, let's just rewrite the structure. So I'm just going to rewrite it down here. So this is what I have. Okay, and I move this pair here and there was an, already another pair there, right? So that's still there. Um, and so here are the other pairs. Okay, so we've moved that lone pair into the bond between the two oxygen atoms. Now let's do an octet count. So the oxygen on the left, it has this pair, this pair, and then these two shared pairs count in this oxygen's electron count. So it looks like we have eight electrons here for this oxygen. It has an octet. The oxygen on the right, a pair here, a pair here, and then also these two shared pairs are counted as well. And so we have an octet here for the oxygen on the right. So it looks like both atoms have octets. So this is a, a stable structure. And so from here, we can finish off the Lewis structure by drawing lines for a shared pair of electrons. So let's do that now. So we have an oxygen atom here, an oxygen atom here. And you can see that we have two shared pairs. So we draw two lines like this, and then you have um, these lone pairs here that are still there in the structure. So this is a correct Lewis structure for O2. So maybe you heard in some past class that oxygen has a double bond, and now you can sort of see why it does have a double bond, is because you needed a double bond so that both oxygen atoms could have octets. And so the way it got it was it basically moved one of its lone pairs into the bond between the oxygen atoms. And so when it has a double bond, it gets an octet for both atoms and it's very stable. Okay, finally, let's look and figure out if this double bond, this bond between the two oxygen atoms, is it a nonpolar covalent, is it a polar covalent, or is it an ionic bond? So the way you evaluate that is looking at the different electronegativities of these oxygen atoms. So this oxygen atom here has electronegativity of 3.5, and this oxygen atom here has the same electronegativity of 3.5. Let me get a better pen. That poop pen is pooping out. So this is 3.5, and this is 3.5. So the difference of electronegativity is going to be 3.5 minus 3.5, which is equal to zero. <laughs> okay, so what that means is, let me draw oxygen again here. So we have oxygen here with a double bond. And so the difference in electronegativity between the two atoms, as expected, is zero. So what that predicts is because these two oxygen atoms have equal electronegativity, these four electrons in the bond, the two shared pairs are going to spend equal amounts of time around each of these oxygen atoms. And so if that is the case, this is a non-polar covalent bond 
that occurs between the oxygen atoms. Um, also, another question you can ask is, is this molecule lopsided in terms of charge? In other words, does it have a delta negative end where it has a relatively excess of electrons and a delta positive end? And the answer is no, because the shared pair is spending equal amounts of time around these oxygen atoms. So there's no delta positive or delta negative to this. Um, so that's basically a non-polar covalent bond between the two oxygen atoms. Okay, so let's move on to the next one. Okay. Okay, so how about NH3? So NH3 is ammonia. NH3 is ammonia. So can you draw a Lewis structure for that? So I'm going to go ahead and draw a skeletal structure. And so what I've done is I put the hydrogens on the outside or the termini of the molecule and the nitrogen is in the center. So that's probably the best thing to do. Okay, so nitrogen has five valence electrons. Hydrogen has three valence electrons. Excuse me, hydrogen has one valence electron. Ah. So it has one valence electron, but there are three of them for a total of three valence electrons contributed by the three hydrogen atoms. So oh, the total number of valence electrons in NH3 is eight. And so that is for pairs. And so can you distribute the four pairs uh, fairly in this molecule? So you first have to bond this nitrogen and this hydrogen. So that's one pair. This pair goes here to bond these two atoms. This pair, third pair goes to that to bond this nitrogen and this hydrogen. And then we have one more pair. So where does it go? So you might remember that hydrogen can only accept a duet of electrons. And it has that in all examples because it has a shared pair. So where does that extra pair go? It goes to nitrogen right there. Okay. So let me redraw this a little bit more carefully. So we'll put that pair there, here, here, and here. So that's just a little bit clearer. Let me get rid of that. Okay. So that is a, looks like a reasonable Lewis structure for um, NH3, which is ammonia. But let's check to make sure that hydrogens have duets and this nitrogen in the center has eight electron octet. So this hydrogen has a duet, this hydrogen has a duet, this hydrogen has a duet. So does the nitrogen in the center have an octet? Yes. And so again, you can count the shared pairs and nitrogens count along with its lone pair. So nitrogen has eight electrons. So the Lewis structure should be this. It should be H, N, don't forget about the lone pair around the nitrogen there. And then we have hydrogen here. Now, if you wanted to, you could evaluate whether these bonds from nitrogen to hydrogen, are they non-polar covalent, polar covalent, or ionic? So I encourage you to do so on your own. Um, I'll let you do that for a few moments now and maybe ask you a question. Okay, so you have maybe figured out um, here that nitrogen has an electronegativity, if you looked it up, um, it has an electronegativity of 3.0. Hydrogen has an electronegativity of 2.1. So the difference of electronegativity between the nitrogen and the hydrogen is 3.0 minus 2.1, which is 0 0.9. So that would classify a bond between nitrogen and hydrogen with an electronegativity difference of 0.9 as being a polar covalent bond. So this, these are polar covalent bonds. And so, as you might expect, nitrogen has the greater electronegativity, so it's going to be delta negative. Well, each of these hydrogens, because they have lesser electronegativities, will be delta positives. Okay, so let's move on. Okay, carbon tetrachloride, so CCl4. Um, so how do we place the atoms in space? So let me show you a couple of possibilities. So maybe one possibility is having a chlorine in the center and maybe a carbon on the outside. And then maybe you can have 
chlorine surrounding the internal chlorine like this, or another possibility is having carbon in the center and then chlorines on the outside. So which possibility is it? Well, another rule you should know, um, in addition to the fact that hydrogens can only be on the outside, the periphery or the termini of the molecule, another rule you should know is that if you have a choice between carbon and chlorine or other atoms, and you're trying to choose which one should be in the center, the one that should be in the center should be the atom with the lesser electronegativity. So hopefully you'll have maybe a chart of electronegativity and you can look up carbon's electronegativity and see it's 2.5. Chlorine's electronegativity is 3.0. So carbon has the slightly lesser electronegativity, so it should be in the center. So this skeletal structure is not correct, so let me redraw the correct one. So there's carbon in the center, and then chlorines on the outside, there are four of them. Okay, let's do a count of valence electrons. So carbon has four valence electrons. Chlorine um, has seven valence electrons, but you have four of them for a total of 28 electrons. So you have 32 electrons you're dealing with total. So that is 16 pairs. Okay, so that's a lot of electrons. Okay, so 16 pairs. Now the first pair goes here, second one goes here, third here, fourth here, because we have to connect the atoms first by pairs. So we're down to 12, right? We have 12 left. So there are four, um, five, six, seven, eight, nine, 10, 11, 12, 13, 14, 15, 16. So this is a, a reasonably good structure. Um, but, and so let me explain why it is a good structure, and you may already know, is because each of these chlorines here has eight electrons, so it has an octet, and then the carbon in the middle, again, you can count the shared electrons with chlorine as part of its count. So the carbon in the middle has eight electrons as well, so it also has an octet. So this isn't considered a perfect Lewis structure. What you have to do to write a perfect Lewis structure is to draw lines for the shared pair of electrons. So you have carbon here, and then we have a chlorine here, a chlorine here, a chlorine here, a chlorine here, and then don't forget in your final Lewis structure to put lone pairs around the chlorine atoms like this. Okay, so this should be a good Lewis structure. Okay, so you can maybe figure out on your own whether the bonds between carbon and chlorine are either non-polar covalent, polar covalent, or ionic, so I'll let you figure that out on your own. Okay, so let's move on to the next molecule. Okay, so this is a bit of a digression in the sense that all the molecules I've done so far are molecular compounds and that they will have a covalent bond between the atoms. And so this next one I wanna do, which is a bit of a digression, is a Lewis structure for an ionic compound. So the ionic compound we're dealing with here is Na2O. So let me go ahead and write out the Lewis structure and then talk about why this is sort of a bit of a digression and it probably will not be on your test. Okay, so here can you calculate the total number of valence electrons in sodium oxide? Um, so sodium, has one valence electron, and there are two of them, so there are a total of two electrons that are contributed by the two sodium atoms. Oxygen has six valence electrons, and so there are a total of eight valence electrons in this structure. Um, and so what we're gonna do is we have to deal with four pairs. So we have to probably have oxygen atom in this ionic compound to be in the center. And so here I can put a sodium here and say a sodium here, and this is correct. Now, let's go ahead and put in the eight valence electrons. And so 
four pairs. So there's a pair here that goes here, a pair here that goes here. So one of the things you might ask is, how about the other pairs? Can we put other pairs around sodium? So sodium is a little bit unusual. It's in group one, and all the group one elements can be stable with just a pair of electrons. So sodium will not get a octet. You'll learn that for group two and group three elements. Those elements um, can be stable without octets, so they can have lower numbers. So here, sodium here will be stable with this pair of electrons, and this sodium will be stable with this pair of electrons. And so we have the other two pairs here, and so this is ionic compound. So this is not quite a correct Lewis structure. When you have an ionic compound, you don't draw lines between the sodiums and the oxygen. You leave them as dots. And the final thing you have to worry about in the Lewis structure for ionic compound is you have to put charges in the, in the ions because, again, these are not atoms here. Remember, this is ionic compound, so these are ions. So the sodium has a positive charge and the oxygen has a negative charge of two minus. And then finally, the anion, which is the oxygen, gets brackets. So this is the correct Lewis structure for an ionic compound. So I don't think you're gonna to have to draw a Lewis structure of an ionic compound for your test because it's a little bit different than the rest of the Lewis structures we're dealing with. But I just wanted to show you, if you have this on your Achieve homework, how you would do that. Okay, so let's move on. Okay, so now they get a little bit more complicated. Okay, so the next molecule is H2CO, which is formaldehyde. And so let's draw some possible skeletal structures of what this could be. So we might have an H here on the terminus, an O here, an H here, and then a carbon up here. So that's a possible skeletal structure. Another possible skeletal structure is having the carbon in the middle and then the oxygen in the periphery. So which skeletal structure is correct? Um, the skeletal structure is correct is both of them have terminal hydrogens, which is good, but there's one skeletal structure that's much better than the other one. The one that's much better is the one where the central atom has less electronegativity than this oxygen here, which has more electronegativity. So this is a good, skeletal structure because carbon has a lesser electronegativity than oxygen and the atom with the lesser electronegativity should go in the center of the structure. So let me erase this one and then let me rewrite this one. So we have carbon here, oxygen, and then hydrogen, and then hydrogen. Okay, so let's count valence electrons. So oxygen has six valence electrons. Carbon here has four valence electrons. There are two hydrogens here, and so we have two hydrogens with one valence electron apiece, so a total of two electrons contributed by the hydrogens. And so what are the total number of valence electrons here? We have six plus four is 10 is 12. So we have 12 valence electrons. So we have to deal with six pairs. So let's see how we do that. Okay, so we put a pair here between this carbon and hydrogen, a pair here between this carbon and hydrogen, a pair here between the carbon and oxygen. And now let's go ahead and we need three more pairs. Okay, so we can put the fourth pair here, the fifth pair here, and we can just put the last pair around oxygen. So what I'm hoping you can sort of see is that this is probably not the best Lewis structure. And the reason is, is while I'm hoping you can sort of see this oxygen here has an octet of electrons, the carbon does not, it only has six electrons, and it needs an octet. So do you remember what you do to create uh, an octet for carbon? What you can do is you can take one of these lone pairs and move it into the bond between carbon and oxygen. So let me redraw the structure here. So the hydrogens are fine. And so what we've done is we moved a lone pair from the oxygen into the carbon-oxygen bond, so there are two pairs here now, and we have the oxygen here, and we have two lone pairs that are left. Okay, now let's do a count of octets, and so you can see that oxygen has an octet, and you can see carbon here also has an octet, and so it looks like 
those are fine. And then the hydrogens here you can see have duets here. Okay, so the final Lewis structure should be this for formaldehyde. So that should be correct. And you can figure out the polarity of the bonds on your own. So let's move on. Okay. So the next molecule is a little odd. It is the nitronium cation. So its formula is NO2, and it has a positive charge. Okay. So what we're going to do is I'm going to draw a skeletal structure. And so there are a bunch of possibilities, but the correct possibility is with nitrogen in the center because it has less electronegativity than oxygen. Oxygen's on the periphery. So let's do a valence electron count. Nitrogen has five electrons. Oxygen has six electrons, but there are two of them for a total of 12 electrons. So we have totally right now at this point 17 electrons, but here's the thing. Note that this molecule has a positive charge. And so you've already learned that when a molecule has a, lot, a positive charge, then it's deficient in one electron. So because this is positively charged, we have to remove an electron from the count. So really we have 16 electrons to deal with, which is eight pairs. Okay. so. Let's go ahead and try to put in the eight pairs. So the first pair bonds this nitrogen oxygen, the second pair here, and then three, four, five, six, seven, eight. And notice what I did here is I tended to put the pairs of electrons in the terminal atoms before I put it in the central atom. And usually that's a, a generally a good practice. Okay, so we can hopefully see that here, we don't really have a good Lewis structure because although the oxygens have octets, this nitrogen does not as four electrons. So what we're going to do is move this pair into the bond between this nitrogen and oxygen and this pair into the bond between this nitrogen and oxygen. So you have nitrogen um, and so there are two pairs here. There's oxygen here like that. And so you have nitrogen here and two pairs with oxygen here. And so we have a pair here for this oxygen and a pair there. And so this should be, it looks to me, a good, reasonably good Lewis structure. Um, and the reason is you can see at the now oxygen here has an octet of electrons. The oxygen here has an octet of electrons. And then the nitrogen here also has an octet of electrons. You can see that these shared pairs count in the electron count for nitrogen. So what would be the structure? So in the end you have nitrogen and there's a double bond to one oxygen atom and then there's a double bond to another oxygen atom. And then what you do is you have to indicate in this molecule that it has a positive charge and so to do that um, what we have to do is put um, brackets around the molecule and then outside the brackets indicate that it has a positive charge like that. So this is the complete Lewis structure of a cation. So here it is, is the, is the cation, the molecule, and then again what we have to do is put in brackets with a positive charge. If it was an anion, in other words it has a negative charge, you put the molecule in brackets and then put a negative charge. And we'll probably do that some practice in class about that one. Okay, so now we're going to move on. So there are molecules where you can write good Lewis structures, but not all the atoms may have an octet, meaning that maybe you have some atoms that have less than an octet, or maybe you have some atoms that have more than an octet. And so you need to be knowledgeable as to when you can write Lewis structures where you have atoms that either have less than an octet or more than an octet. So let me give you a few examples of those. So a good example to start with is where we have a molecule that actually has an odd number of valence electrons. So all the examples we've seen so far is all molecules have had even numbers of valence electrons and so we had pairs that we can move around. 
Now, not all molecules will have that situation. Some of them will have an odd number of electrons. So what do you do about that? So the first one we're going to consider is a molecule called nitric oxide. And so let's go ahead and write the skeletal structure for that. Okay. No. Okay. And so let's go ahead and count valence electrons. So we have nitrogen, which has five valence electrons. And then we have oxygen, which has six valence electrons. And so what you can see here is we have a total of 11 valence electrons. So you can see we do not have an even number of valence electrons. So what do you do? Okay, so the way I think about this to start is I think about this, we have five pairs plus one extra electron. So let's go ahead and throw in the five pairs and see what happens. Okay, so the pair one here, two, three, four, Five. Okay, so remembering we have an extra electron that we have to place in, let's go ahead and see if we can create octets. And so what you can see right now that, that neither the nitrogen or an oxygen atom has an octet, right? So what we can do is we can go ahead and move electrons in. So for example, you could move in this pair here in between the nitrogen and oxygen, and you can move this pair here in between the nitrogen and oxygen. And what would you get? So we would get something like this. And so um, we've moved in two extra pairs between the nitrogen and oxygen. So now it has a total of three pairs here. And here's the oxygen atom with its pair. And you say, oh, great. <laughs> All these atoms have octets. You're done. Well, here's the problem. You have one extra electron. And so you can see that if you put the one extra electron around nitrogen, it won't have eight electrons, it'll have nine electrons. If you put the extra electron on oxygen, it won't have eight electrons, it'll have nine electrons. So we can't use this. And so we have to think of a different approach. Okay, so here, let me just draw out again what we had before, before I started moving in electrons and think about something else we can do. So how about this? Let me just move in one pair from say the nitrogen here and then let's look at that structure. And not all atoms will have an octet, but that's okay. Um, some atoms, if they have an odd number of electrons, they don't have to have an octet. They can have seven electrons and they'll be fine. Um, so here, what I'm gonna do is write out this structure here. And so we have this pair goes into between the atoms here. And so what you can see is this is what it looks like so far. And so the oxygen has an octet, but the nitrogen does not. But what we can do is put one more electron on that nitrogen. So now um, the nitrogen uh, now has seven electrons. And so that isn't the most stable structure in the world, but it's better than having six electrons. And so this is actually a correct Lewis structure. Now you can go the other way if you wanted to. You didn't necessarily have to put nitrogen's um, pair in between the nitrogen and oxygen, you could put an oxygen's pair between the nitrogen and the oxygen. So it would look like this really quick. Let's see if I can do this right. Okay. Um, and I think it would look like that, yeah. And so here the odd electron would go around oxygen. So is there one structure that predominates? And the answer is yes, for reasons I don't quite understand. You have to take physical chemistry to understand this. But basically, if you have an odd electron, it occurs prefers to be on a less electronegative atom. So this is the preferred structure. Okay, so let's move on to another one, one that may be more important, although you definitely need another one I just did. Okay, so how about boron trihydride? Let's draw a Lewis structure for that with the rules that we know so far. Okay, so boron is going to be in the middle, hydrogen on the outside, so that's fine. Um, so boron here has three valence electrons, and hydrogen each has one valence electron. Um, and so there are three of them there for a total of three valence electrons from the hydrogen. So you have six electrons total, or three pairs. Okay, so we connect here of the first pair, we connect boron to hydrogen, the second pair between this boron and this hydrogen, and the third pair here. So we've done with our 
valence electrons. We only had six electrons that we could use, three pairs. So we're done. So with the hydrogens here, they're stable, but how about the boron? And you say with the boron, well, wait a minute, the boron doesn't have an octet, isn't that a problem? And the answer is boron doesn't necessarily have to have an octet. Sometimes it does, but most of the time it does not. Boron is in group three, and group three elements do not have to have an octet to be stable. They can have just six electrons to be stable. So let me just kind of point that out in the periodic table here really quickly. And so I'll just draw this really fast. Just to point out, when you have elements in group three here, boron, aluminum, gallium, and just so on, um, so these elements um, don't need octet. And so they don't need an octet and they'll be happy with six electrons. So I'll just indicate that there. So that's just something to keep in mind when you draw structures. Okay, so let me turn it back. Um, so to complete this Lewis structure, it'll be boron, hydrogen, hydrogen, hydrogen. So that is a good Lewis structure for boron trihydride. So let's move on. So the next one is beryllium dihydride. So we have beryllium dihydride. Okay, so beryllium has two valence electrons. Hydrogen has one, but there are two of them. So there's two valence electrons. So you have four electrons here. So you have two pairs that you can deal with in the structure. So we put beryllium in the middle, better pen, <laughs> beryllium in the middle, and then hydrogens on the end like that. So we have a pair here and a pair here. And so this is all the electrons we're allowed to have in the structure because we counted up a total of four valence electrons or two pairs. So this is it. All we can do is put in four electrons. And you say, oh wait, so the hydrogens are stable, but the beryllium, we have a problem with beryllium. Okay, no, we, we probably don't have a problem with beryllium. And the reason is beryllium is an atom in the group two um, column. And if you have atoms in group two, then those atoms are stable with a number of electrons that's less than an octet. And so in this case, beryllium will be stable with four electrons. So this is a stable structure. So let me just kind of point that out in the periodic table here. So here, beryllium, magnesium, calcium, those are elements in group two. Um, and so if you have those elements, um, in a Lewis structure, they don't need an octet. So same rule here, they don't need an octet. Um, they will be happy uh, with four electrons in their Lewis structure. So that's just something to keep in mind. Okay, so we're gonna go back here. Uh, let me complete the Lewis structure really quick. So you put lines for the shared pairs and that should be a, a good Lewis structure for beryllium dihydride. Okay, so moving on. Um, let me go back here. There we go. All right, a few more. Two more, yay, and then we're done. Okay, so the next molecule is arsenic. Yeah, this is a nasty one. So this is arsenic pentabromide. Don't want to breathe that in. That would most certainly kill you. Okay, so what is the valence electron count for this molecule? So arsenic um, has, you can look it up, it's in group 15. Um, so, or group five, depending on the, the naming system you use. So it has five valence electrons. Um, bromine has seven valence electrons, and there are five of them here. Um, so if that's the case, we have a total of 35 valence electrons contributed by bromine, five from arsenic. So there's a total of 40 electrons, and then there are going to be 20 pairs. So that's a lot of electrons. So arsenic has the slightly lesser electronegativity, so it's gonna be in the middle. So let's distribute the bromines around. So it is possible with elements that are in period three or higher, like period four and period five, that those elements will be stable with a number of electrons that's greater than an octet. So you might have a, the central atom um, being in period three or period four, 
um, and it will be stable, say, with 10 electrons or 12 electrons. And so this is the case with arsenic. Arsenic, as I recall, is in period four. If it's in period three or four or five, anything that's not period two, period three, four or five, that atom will be stable with more than an octet of electrons. And so, as you can see, we're gonna have to do that to bond all these bromines in the structure. So let me put in the 20 pairs. So I'm just gonna quickly draw lines for the shared pair, two, three, four, five. And then we have 15 pairs left, six, seven, eight, nine, 10, 11, 12, 13, 14, uh, let's see, 15, 16, 17, 18, 19, 20. So this is a good Lewis structure for arsenic pentabromide. So again, arsenic, you can see that has more than octet. It has 10 electrons and that's permitted. So let me kind of explain that on the periodic table again. So just a note, if you have elements in the second period here, if you have carbon, nitrogen, oxygen, fluorine, or neon, these elements in the second period are required to have an octet to be stable. If you have elements, say, in the third period or the fourth period or anything lower than that, so going down here, um, those elements, they can have an octet, but they may, don't necessarily have to have an octet. They can have more than an octet. They can have 10 electrons or 12 electrons. So here is the position of arsenic, and you can see it's in period four. So arsenic, because it's in period four, it's not in period two, it's in period four, it can have more than an octet. So it did in that structure. Okay, so let's do the final one. Um, the final one is um, selenium hexachloride. It sounds like another deadly molecule. Okay, so selenium hexachloride. Okay, so selenium, um, it's in group six or 16, depending on the, the, the system that you use to give you group numbers. So selenium has six elect valence electrons and chlorine has seven. And then there are um, six chlorine atoms for a total of 42 electrons, valence electrons contributed by the seven chlorines. So it looks like we have a total of what? 48 electrons or 24 pairs. Okay. So selenium, as I recall, is in period four. So it can have a greater number of electrons than an octet to make it stable. It can have 10 electrons or even 12 electrons. Looks like it's gonna have 12 electrons because we're gonna to have to bond six chlorines to it. And so let's go ahead and put in the electrons. There's 24 pairs. First pair, second pair, third pair, fourth pair, fifth pair, sixth pair. Now we put the other, lone, other pairs as lone pairs around the chlorine. So that's seven, eight, nine, 10, 11, 12, 13, 14, 15, 16, 17, 18, 19, 20, 21, 22, 23, 24. And so this is a perfectly good Lewis structure for this molecule. Again, selenium, it doesn't necessarily have to have an octet because it's not in period two, it's in period four, so it can have more than an octet. It can have 10 electrons or 12 electrons here. It looks like it has 12 electrons. Chlorines, though, do have octets and so should be stable. So this should be a good structure for the molecule. Thank you for listening to that. We'll see you next time.